All right. Well, chapter 13 is all about radical reactions. Now, we have seen radicals before, but uh, we want to get into them in more depth and understanding. So we'll start with just a brief introduction of what a radical is. So first of all, radical, it's a reactive intermediate and uh, it, is, uh, it has a single unpaired electron. And so we represent that by putting a dot. Uh, that means we don't have paired electrons. We have single, uh, single unpaired electrons. And we form radicals by homolysis of a covalent bond. So we break that bond evenly. So one electron goes to one atom and one electron goes to the other atom. Uh, well, typically what we'll find is uh, it, it, it can't have a full octet. So uh, when you have single electrons, that means that we're going to have an odd number of electrons around each atom. And, uh, and so that means we will not have an octet. And when we're drawing out radicals and mechanisms, we use the half-headed arrows uh, for the curved arrow formalism that we've talked about before. And these arrows, uh, we, when we talked about them at first, way back in, I think, chapter six or something, um, uh, we indicated that they, we use the half-headed arrows. So, um, and they look kind of like fish hooks. So we want to look at the structure of radicals. Um, and so carbon radicals, we can classify them as primary, secondary, or tertiary. Now, technically, we can also have a methyl radical, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, and so uh, the primary, secondary, or tertiary, that just indicates how many R groups, carbon-bearing groups, there are attached to the carbon with the radical. Uh, those, car uh, those carbons can be uh, alkyl groups or they can be, uh, they can be uh, you know, aerial groups or even a, a carbon with a double bond. So all kinds of possibilities there, but we do classify them as primary, secondary, and tertiary. As far as the structure of the carbon, it is sp2 hybridized, which means that any of these atoms are going to be coplanar with the carbon. So they'll all be in a plane and we'll have the uh, P orbital is perpendicular to the SP3 orbitals that are, in, uh, that are in those bonds. And it has a single electron in it. So an unpaired electron. Now, our first, uh, our first assignment here, our first thing on uh, the in-class assignment is really, really easy. Uh, and, you know, you'll wish that they're all this easy, but we want to classify each radical here as being either primary, secondary, or tertiary. So we just look at the carbon that has the radical here. It's this middle one. And with that, we can see clearly that there are two carbons attached. So this one is secondary. So we'll put a little secondary. This carbon has three carbons attached to it. So this one, of course, is tertiary. And then here, this one, uh, we've got two carbons attached there. And so we will call that one secondary. And then this one, uh, there's only one carbon attached, so it is primary. And we want to be able to identify which carbons are primary, secondary, or tertiary. And we want to be able to do that really, really easily, which is why I have a practice problem on here. All right, so let's go back. Uh, to our lecture, and we want to look at bond dissociation energies. How much energy does it take to homolytically cleave a bond? And so we use the bond dissociation energies, uh, and they're really enthalpies, uh, but we use these bond dissociation enthalpies uh, uh, for the cleavage of carbon-hydrogen bonds to measure how stable the carbon radical is. Um, and we'll find that the stronger the bond is, the less stable the resulting radical. So, for example, uh, when we look at these two numbers here, we've got propane. Uh, with propane, uh, the carbon on the end is a primary hydrogen, or it, yeah, it's a primary hydrogen. And when we cleave that, we get a primary radical. 
and it has a bond association enthalpy of 410 kilojoules per mole. That means uh, to break that bond homolytically to give the carbon radical and the hydrogen radical, it would take 410 kilojoules per mole of energy. Likewise, if we also on propane, if instead we take the hydrogen that is on carbon 2, uh, which is a secondary hydrogen, we would form a secondary radical. Well, that bond association enthalpy is uh, 397 kilojoules per mole. And so that tells us that the uh, secondary radical is more stable than the primary radical by about 13 kilojoules. Now, one quick thing about this particular reaction. We never actually do this particular reaction like in an experiment. Uh, and that's because uh, in this reaction, we're forming uh, two new radicals and we'd be forming the hydrogen radical, which is really, really difficult to form. Typically, the hydrogen radical only forms in very extreme high temperature situations. Um, and so we, we typically just won't see the hydrogen radical. However, um, and, and so, you know, when they determine these values, the way they determine them is by, is by adding together other uh, other delta H for radical reactions, and they, they, can, they can get these numbers back out. We use these to tell us how strong the bond is and, in turn, how stable these radicals are. All right, so the lower that bond association enthalpy was, the more stable the bond. So we'll find more substituted uh, carbons um, the smaller the bond association energy is going to be, or enthalpy. And so here are a few examples. All right. So uh, here we've got methyl uh, or methane. If we break that carbon hydrogen bond, it takes 435 kilojoules per mole to break it. Uh, for a primary uh, carbon to break the carbon hydrogen, 410 kilojoules. And it doesn't really matter whether we have like ethane or propane or butane or we could go to bigger molecules. As long as it's on the uh, uh, primary carbon and the next thing is also a carbon, then that bond enthalpy is going to stay pretty much the same. Now, as soon as you start adding other stuff to this, other either other carbon atoms or perhaps if you were to add, uh, um, you know, electron donating or electron withdrawing groups, um, some other interesting things could happen here. But we're we're going to uh, we're going to just look at these numbers. Here we've got a secondary carbon hydrogen bond uh, and we'll see 397 kilojoules that we saw that value a minute ago. And then for this tertiary carbon hydrogen, uh, it is uh, 381. Well, the more substituted radicals have lower bond association energies, which means those radicals are more stable. So we'll find the more substituents, the more stable it is. So this one, uh, the difference between this radical and this radical is about 25 kilojoules uh, of energy difference. And that is a really, really big difference. 25 kilojoules is, uh, uh, I mean, like I said, it's just an enormous difference between those two values. Between primary and secondary, we'll see that it is uh, about 13 kilojoules, as we saw a few minutes ago. And between secondary and tertiary, it's another, what, 16 kilojoules per mole. So that means, um, you know, these are very different hydrogens when it comes to removing them and forming these radicals. All right, so now we want to look at some of the general features of radical reactions, like what, what kinds of things do we need to do to make the reactions work, and what kinds of reactions are we actually going to be doing? So we'll start with... Uh, We'll start with how do we make radicals to begin with? And uh, the most common ways to make radicals are either heat or light. And typically that light is going to be ultraviolet light, although there are some bonds that you can, uh, you can shine like regular visible light on and you can break those bonds. It really depends on how strong the bond is. All right. So, um, a lot of times we will carry out a, uh, a radical reaction in the presence of a radical initiator. And I'll show you an example of one of those here in just a minute. If you want to have a radical initiator, you need to have something that has a fairly weak bond. 
Uh, and we're going to look at the, the bond energies. Uh, we'll look at those here in a minute. Uh, but we'll find that these bond energies uh, uh, that are very weak, those tend to make good radicals. Um, one of the most common types of radical initiators are going to be peroxides. Peroxides have oxygen-oxygen bonds, and they are much, much weaker than carbon-hydrogen and carbon-carbon bonds, or even carbon-oxygen bonds. These oxygen-oxygen bonds, just by comparison, typical oxygen-oxygen bond is going to be about 140 to 150 kilojoules per mole to break that bond homolytically, so 140, 150 if you look back on the previous page, um, all of those carbon-hydrogen bonds that we looked at were about 400 kilojoules per mole. So those were about three times as strong as, as the oxygen-oxygen bonds here. That means we can form these oxygen radicals pretty easily. All right, so heating it up uh, in the presence of that weak oxygen-oxygen uh, um, bond uh, gives us two radicals and then those radicals can go on and do other interesting reactions. All right, there are two main types of reactions that we're going to be looking at. Uh, and the two types of reactions uh, are where the radical reacts with a sigma bond, typically a carbon hydrogen bond or a halogen halogen bond. And then uh, when the radical adds to a pi bond and we'll look at all of these examples. All right, so let's start when we have something like a halogen uh, and it reacts with a carbon-hydrogen bond. So uh, if we have a radical and uh, if, if it's in the presence of a, um, a sigma bond, uh, like a carbon-hydrogen bond, uh, the radical can abstract. And we use the word abstract to mean that the radical uh, uh, will grab that hydrogen and sort of break the carbon-hydrogen bond. Um, and uh, make a new bond. And so again, we use the word abstract. So this ra uh, radical comes along and abstracts that hydrogen. And you'll notice we draw the, the two fish hook uh, half head arrows to a same point. It doesn't have to be right at the plus. I usually put it over to the side a little bit. And then we take the other electron that's in this carbon hydrogen bond and we, uh, we give it to the carbon. And so we'll get a new carbon radical, which is also very reactive. Uh, and uh, and then we have this new hydrogen whatever bond. And like I said, often these are halogens, but they can be oxygen in certain situations. If we have a reaction between a radical and a carbon-carbon double bond or a pi bond, all right, so it can react with the carbon-carbon double bond or the pi bond of that carbon-carbon double bond. All right, we're going to form a new uh, bond between our radical, or what was the radical, and a carbon. And then the other electron is going to go to the other carbon that was in the pi bond. And so we will form a new radical. In either of the cases that we looked at, with either the carb, with reacting with the sigma bond or reacting with the pi bond, uh, you'll notice that one, we get a new bond between whatever our radical was and something else, and we get a new radical out of it. All right, we can also have a reaction where radicals react with each other. All right, so, um, so if we've got two radicals that come together, they can form a sigma bond. And uh, an example of this, if, uh, if we heat up chlorine, if we just heat up chlorine, we'll form chlorine radicals. But also, if we take two chlorine radicals and they're just sitting there and they bump into each other, they're going to react and give us... Uh, uh, give us a chlorine-chlorine bond. So uh, this is just one of the reactions. Uh, and we'll, when we talk about the reactions, we'll call this a termination step. Um, it's an it's a important type of reaction that we need to be aware of. All right, and then the final ty type of reaction that I want you to be aware of is uh, where a radical can react with oxygen. Now, oxygen in its stable ground state configuration, oxygen, O2, is actually a di-radical. So all the oxygen that you breathe is this di-radical. And if it weren't di-radical, it'd actually be 
uh, it would actually be quite quite dangerous for uh, you to breathe. So so we uh, were, you know, all the oxygen, just a normal O2 is a diuretical. And so, uh, and so a radical that is present in the, you know, the, around oxygen can actually react with that oxygen and form a new sigma bond. Um, that still leaves a radical on the other oxygen. So that doesn't go away. All right. And, um, Often when this happens, if we're trying to do a radical reaction like on purpose, uh, if we have oxygen present, that oxygen can slow down the reaction or even stop the reaction or make it so that you don't get any of the product that you want. Uh, when, you know, when uh, I used to make polymers using radical reactions, we had to purge the oxygen out of it. And if we didn't, um, then often our reactions just didn't work right. So, um, we call things that will react with other radicals, radical inhibitors or radical scavengers. And they can either be oxygen like this, or they can be what we call stable radicals uh, and do that, you know, two radicals coming together like we saw on the previous page. And we'll, um, we'll see that a little bit later. So let's look at number three on the in-class assignment. All right, so we want to draw the products between uh, a chlorine atom and each of these. So here we've got uh, we've got uh, ethane. So we'll put plus chlorine, and we've got a radical there. And I'll just put a big dot there. So uh, when that happens, um, this chlorine will react with a carbon hydrogen bond. It'll abstract the hydrogen. So the things that we are going to get are going to be an H. CL bond and we'll form another radical. So we'll have CH3, CH2 radical. And it doesn't matter which radical you put the, the carbon, uh, which carbon you put the radical on, um, that, that doesn't matter because they're identical. Uh, but that's the net reaction. All right, if we have a pi bond, all right, with a pi bond, um, again, that radical will react with the pi bond. And so we can have like chlorine, CH2, single bond, CH2, and then the radical. And then that, that's it to the reaction. So we'll have two things that come together to give us one thing, and it's still a radical. All right, we also have the possibility, and here this is a chlorine radical. In case you can't see it, I'll put the dot there. So I'll draw it the other way around here. We've got the two chlorines. Well, these two radicals uh, can come together to form just chlorine. And we saw this, uh, we saw this in, the, uh, in the presentation just a little bit earlier. And so that's one of the types of reactions. And then finally, oxygen. This was just like the one we saw a few minutes ago uh, on the slide just before we came over. And so here we've got a radical. That radical can react with the oxygen radical and so we can get oxygen radical all right I suppose I could put all the electrons in here all right and so you you can see that uh, that we've got uh, we've got that as a product so it's important that we know the different types of radical reactions, and that's something that we are going to focus on. So we'll switch back over to our presentation. And we want to look at our first type of radical reaction, and that is radical halogenation of alkanes. And this is, this is a really pretty interesting kind of reaction. All right, so in the presence of heat or light, uh, an alkane will react with halogens and we'll get alkyl chlorides uh, uh, by a radical substitution reaction. So typically we'll have either chlorine or bromine, and I'll talk about why we can't use the other ones, but we'll have chlorine and bromine and they will react, they'll abstract the, the hydrogen from a carbon hydrogen bond, and then we'll end up getting uh, a halogen that reacts with that chlorine 
And so it's essentially a, a, a trade-off, right? We, it's a metathesis type reaction. This carbon-hydrogen bond is broken. This uh, halogen-halogen bond is broken. And we get a carbon-halogen and a hydrogen-halogen bond. As I mentioned, you can only do this with chlorine and bromine. If you attempt to do this with fluorine, you're going to have a bad day. Uh, uh, the fluorine, it, uh, it reacts so violently, it's like it catches on fire. Um, it will go through and react with all the hydrogens and, and, and probably your glassware as well. So it's, it's a very exciting thing to use uh, fluorine. With the iodine, if you attempt to do it with iodine, the reaction energy just doesn't work. Uh, it's it's too slow and and not very it it, it doesn't uh, the energy doesn't work so but we can only do it with the chlorine and bromine. Sometimes when we do these reactions, we'll find um, that we can get more than one halogenation product. Right. So for example, here we've got uh, cyclohexane on cyclohexane. There's only one type of hydrogen, right? All six carbons are identical and all six, uh, all 12 hydrogens on there are identical. So if we get the monohalogenated product of that, there's only one and that's just bromocyclohexane. Uh, with propane, we have two different types of hydrogens because we have two different types of carbon. So we've got the, the carbons on the end, uh, and so those are primary uh, hydrogens, and we have secondary hydrogens here. And so that means that we get two different products. Uh, and so here we end up getting a, approximately a one-to-one -one mixture of the one chloropropane and the two chloropropane. Now, um, uh, sometimes we want a mixture of products, but sometimes we don't. So this can be problematic or it can be beneficial. It just depends on what kind of reaction you're doing. Most of the time when we're doing organic synthesis, we don't want a big mixture of products. All right. To further complicate things, it is possible to do polyhalogenation of alkanes. Uh, if you use uh, excess halogen, so if you put too much halogen in there, uh, uh, you can actually replace some of more than one of the hydrogens. So, if, for example, here we've got uh, we've got methane, and if we react that with chlorine in the presence of light, we can get chloromethane. Well, it turns out that these hydrogens are still reactive. In fact, they may be a little bit more reactive. It just depends on on uh, on what it is you attach. In this case with chlorine, it is a little bit more reactive. So you can abstract one of those and you can end up getting dichloromethane. All right. And sometimes you want dichloromethane, but uh, in, in, in many cases, we don't want a disubstituted product. If, uh, if there's still more halogen left over, you can get trichloromethane. And, uh, and even then, uh, you can go on trichloromethane, also called chloroform, which you probably have heard of. Uh, it's an organic solvent. And then uh, and then if you go all the way, you can get uh, tetrachloromethane or what we like to call carbon tetrachloride. And carbon tetrachloride um, used to be a very popular solvent uh, until, I don't know, probably about 40 years ago, uh, um, they figured out that it was quite carcinogenic and they have stopped using it as, as much as they used to. So it's become a lot more expensive. It was a great solvent because uh, because the carbon is already oxidized. Uh, carbon tetrachloride is essentially uh, non-flammable, as, as are dichloromethane and chloroform. So it's um, it's a great solvent. It has really high density and uh, it's non-flammable. Really desirable properties. Uh, the undesirable properties, of course, it, it can give you cancer. So, all right. So let's go over and look at number 32 and we want to draw the mono substitution products uh, mono halogenation products typically uh, typically when I ask you to do uh, you know give a product I want you to give me the mono halogenation product uh, unless I'm specifically asking so let's look at the different types of hydrogens on here so we've got this type of hydrogen, uh, which is identical to these two. So I'm not going to circle those. 
this carbon is quaternary, so it does not have any hydrogen, so we're not going to circle it. We've got this one, which is uniquely different, that one, that one, and that one. So since there's five different carbons there that have hydrogens that are, that are unique, that means there's five, we're going to have five different products. All right, so our five different products, uh, um, and again, this is just monohalogenation. If we get in polyhalogenation, we're going to get something even weirder. So we'll do that one first. So chlorine, uh, now we'll do this one. All right, now we'll do this one. All right. So now we'll do this one. Left one off there. So we're doing that one, so it'll be here. And then we'll do the final one, which is on that final carbon. All right, so there are the five different products that we would get with this. All right, for this one, well, we know the ones on the ends are the same, so this one is the same as that one, so I'm not gonna circle that one. This one is the same as that one. Uh, this one is the same as that one, and then this one is the one that's in the middle. So here, we're gonna have four different products. All right, so we'll just start with, well, I'll start here. So chlorine, so that's one. Uh, I didn't leave enough space over there. So there's two. Now we'll do the third one. Three. And then finally, we'll do this one that's in the middle. So four different products there. All right, we'll do a similar thing here on part C. We'll circle the different types. So uh, this one is clearly unique. That one is unique. Uh, and then this one is the same as that one. And this one is the same as that one. So we have four products on this particular um, on this particular hydrocarbon. So we'll start with that one. And we'll go to this one. And then finally... We'll do that one. So we've got four different products there. So that one, that one, that one, and that one. All right. Well, let's go back and look here. So we now want to look at the mechanism of halogenation. And with the mechanism, this is, uh, um, we're going to look at what sequence of steps are occurring. All right. Um, and there are a couple of things that are important as far as understanding what's going on. Uh, we'll find that um, there are a couple of hints when we have radical reactions that, you know, things that are not ionic, we get the radical reactions. One, if, if it requires light or heat or an added peroxide to make the reaction occur, then it might be a, it might be a radical reaction. Now we do heat up other reactions, but if there's light involved, it's a pretty good chance there's some radicals that are involved. Uh, and peroxides, definitely you're going to have radicals involved. So um, those are uh, reasons why uh, we would, we would say it's radical. Uh, if oxygen happens to inhibit the reaction, that's a pretty good sign that it's radical because oxygen diradicals is really good at reacting with other radicals. If we don't observe, uh, if we don't have rearrangements, then um, uh, that's not surprising. Uh, radicals don't have rearrangements. If you recall, if you have a 
secondary carbocation and it's adjacent to another atom that is either tertiary or quaternary, you can get out, you know, a one, two shift in order to get a tertiary carbocation. Well, with radicals, we don't have to worry about that. There are three distinct parts of radical reactions, and those three distinct parts are initiation, propagation, and termination. Now, first, let's look at the overall reaction. When we're doing the overall reaction for, uh, for a radical halogenation, uh, we'll look at we're breaking a carbon-hydrogen bond and a halogen-halogen bond, and we're getting a carbon-halogen bond and a hydrogen-halogen bond, in this case, chlorine. All right. The first step, which is initiation, is homolytic cleavage of this Cl2. And again, this either happens by light uh, or by heat. When we do that, we break that bond and we get two, uh, for every molecule of this, we'll get two chlorine radicals. And that's our initiation step. For propagation, we'll find the propagation step uh, uh, with the propagation step, there are two propagation steps, and we're labeling those as step two and three in this reaction. This was step one, and so these are steps two and three. So the first one, we abstract a hydrogen using the chlorine, and we form a carbon radical and one of our products, HCl, so one of our products, and then that carbon radical can react with another molecule of chlorine, when we do, when we shine light on chlorine, it does not react all of those chlorines at the same time. It just creates a few, uh, breaks a few of those apart to create some chlorine radicals. Uh, and so there's going to be plenty of the Cl2 that's left over. That radical can come in and react with the Cl2. We'll get a new bond between carbon and halogen, and we'll get a chlorine radical. Well, that chlorine radical can go back and react with a carbon-hydrogen bond. So step two and three happen over and over and over again. And they continue to happen until one of those radicals runs into another radical. And when that occurs, we call that a termination step. And there's three possibilities, right? If we have two different, uh, two different types of radicals, we have chlorine radicals and carbon radicals. Well, we can either have two chlorine radicals come together, two carbon radicals come together, or we can have the carbon and the chlorine radical come together. So um, the most common of these is where the two uh, chlorine radicals come together, uh, they run into each other, and they just form chlorine again. Fortunately, that's not a big deal because we use chlorine in this in step three, and also uh, it could potentially undergo the radical cleavage again. So that one is not a big deal. Uh, with this one in step four, uh, here we clean or we have a reaction between the two carbon radicals and we end up getting this uh, uh, new carbon carbon bond uh, and uh, this reaction doesn't happen very significantly there's not very much of this reaction that is occurring uh, and that's a good thing because uh, that was not the goal of our reaction so it's this is what we call a byproduct and then finally, our other termination step is where if we happen to have a carbon radical and a halogen radical come together, we can get one of our products. Now, not very much of this is going to occur because the concentration of radicals is usually pretty low. So we, we don't get a lot of it happening by this, this pathway. Most of the product is formed by, you know, steps two and three happening over and over and over again. All right, so I'm going to use this numbering. So one for this reaction, two and three for this, and then uh, four A, B, and C for our termination steps. We want to look at the delta H for each propagation step. And we only need to look at the energy differences for the propagation steps uh, to determine the delta H of the overall reaction. Uh, and I'll... I'll explain why that is in a minute, but the, the propagation steps have to add together to give us the, uh, the overall reaction. And so uh, the sum of the delta H's for those propagation steps are going to give us the overall delta H of the reaction. For, uh, how, for chlorination, both of our propagation steps are exothermic. So our propagation step, which here we're calling one on the previous page, we called it two and three, but we'll call it one and two here 
So here, when we break this carbon-hydrogen bond, it takes 410 kilojoules of energy to break that bond, and we get uh, 431 kilojoules of energy when we make the new uh, hydrogen-chlorine bond. So we, you know, plus this and then subtract this, and that gives us negative 21. So that's a favorable reaction. The other reaction is where the carbon radical reacts with the halogen radical, uh, or halogen, not halogen radical, halogen. Uh, we break that cl chlorine chlorine bond, 242 kilojoules per mole, and we form a new carbon chlorine bond. And in this case, that carbon chlorine bond is worth uh, 339. We subtract that number because because uh, 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 we're forming that particular bond. So finally, when we come over here, we'll see that that gives us a difference of negative 97. And then when we add these two steps together, our overall reaction uh, is uh, negative 118. So it's a very exothermic reaction. It gives off, gives off heat. All right. And then finally, we want to look at the energy diagram for our, our two propagation steps. As we saw on that previous page, both of these uh, steps, both of the propagation steps are exothermic. So we have two exothermic steps. So here uh, there's a one exothermic step and there is another exothermic step. All right. So that is for radical chlorination of alkanes. We're going to look at radical bromination on number 55. And there are some subtle differences here um, that you'll see. All right, I've zoomed out a little bit uh, um, so that we can get more on the page. Hopefully, you'll be able to see everything. All right, so consider the uh, this reaction. So we've got uh, we've got isobutane reacting with bromine, bromine to give us uh, uh, tert-butyl bromide and HBr. Now I'm going to write out the individual steps here uh, and draw what bond, or not the individual steps, I'm going to draw what bonds are being broken and formed. So here we've got this carbon-hydrogen bond that's on a tertiary carbon and then we've got the bromine-bromine bond And then the bonds that we're making is a new carbon bromine bond and then the HBr bond. So we want to know what the energies of each of those bonds are. And to do that, I'm going to go over to uh, I'm going to go over to a document that I have here. All right, so this is, uh, this is a, uh, in the appendix of your textbook, this is appendix E, and it has the strength of some of these bonds. So we'll start with this one. Here's the HBr, and it is 368. Made a mistake there. 368. And just to show you what I... I'm doing here, I, uh, I'm writing down the number directly underneath. All right, so 368. Um, next, here, let's see, let's find the carbon hydrogen uh, where it's tri substituted. All right, so right here, uh, 381. Again, I've written 381 there. We want the bromine bromine, which is right here at 192. All right. And then we want that carbon bromine, and we want the tri substituted one here at 272. It's right here, just in case you're curious. So 272. All right, so part A says uh, calculate delta H for this reaction. So when we're calculating delta H, if 
for our overall reaction. I'll put that. All right, uh, we want to get uh, the bonds that are broken. So we'll do the bonds that are broken. So the bond association enthalpy of this carbon hydrogen. And then the bond, the other bond that was broken, the bond association enthalpy. Usually we use D. Uh, um, D just means dissociation. So the bond association enthalpy of a bromine, a bromine bond. And then we'll subtract away the bond association enthalpies of the bonds that are formed. And I made a mistake here. We want the carbon hydrogen as the bond that we broke. And our bond association enthalpy of uh, uh, Br, H, HBr, however you want to put that. So let's put those numbers together here. This one is uh, 381 plus uh, the bromine. Bromine is worth 192. And then this one is 272 plus 368. All right, I'm going to bring in my calculator here. And we'll add these numbers together. So uh, 381 plus 192. So that part is 573 and then 272 plus 368, 640. So we can already tell this is going to be an exothermic reaction. All right, so let me go back and grab that number. So this minus that and we get negative 67 kilojoules per mole so for every mole of this reaction that occurs uh, uh, we're going to release 67 kilojoules of energy of heat energy all right so that is part a we'll go ahead and label that part a there. All right, part B, draw out a stepwise mechanism for the reaction, including initiation, propagation, and termination steps. This is going to be just like what we saw in uh, uh, when we were looking at chlorine, except the difference here, it's going to be bromine. All right, so we'll start with our uh, initiation step. And so our initiation step is uh, bromine. Giving us two Br radicals. All right, and you can write those Br radicals separately or you can put two in front. Now we are going to do the curved arrows, and as you remember, we're going to use the fish hook, so we'll do uh, um, half-headed arrows, one going to one bromine and one going to the other bromine. And that's our initiation step. Now for our propagation steps. All right, so for our propagation steps, we are going to uh, um, we'll do where the bromine radical reacts with our carbon hydrogen bond so we'll get uh, ch3 3 carbon hydrogen reacts with a bromine radical all right and we're going to take that radical and we're going to go to some point in the middle i'm going to go just to the side of this plus so half-headed arrow there 
We'll take one of the electrons in that bond and we'll go to the same location. So we'll bring them together. And that means that we're forming a new bond between hydrogen and bromine. And then we're going to take the other electron that's in this bond and it's going to go to carbon. All right. Since that went to carbon, that means we're going to have a carbon radical. So CH3, 3 carbon radical plus HBr. And you'll see at this point that we've produced one of our products. So we produce one of our products. And let me make that carbon radical a little clearer here. All right, so make that a little bit clearer. All right, and now let's do the other propagation step. And that's where this carbon radical is going to react with Br2. So CH3, 3 carbon radical plus Br, Br. All right, and here I'm going to go to there and then take one of the electrons from that bromine bond. All right, and so we're going to form a new bond between carbon and bromine. And then the other electron is going to go to the other bromine. And we'll get that bromine radical. All right, and that, uh, that bromine radical can then go back and react with another carbon-hydrogen bond. And so this is the steps two and three that we saw in, that, in the previous thing. So I'm going to label this as step one, this is step two, and this is step three. And then, as you recall, we had termination steps. And we called those termination steps, uh, we called those, uh, what, A, B, and C. So we'll, we'll do the same numbering here. All right, so one possibility uh, is that we can have the two bromines, and I'm going to do it in the same order. Yeah, I'm going to do it in the same order that we had for the other one. So we'll have the bromine radical plus another bromine radical. Those can react and would give us a bromine-bromine bond. And we'll do the same thing here with the arrows. So we'll have one that comes here and one that goes there. And that will give us a new bromine-bromine bond. All right, uh, another termination step. And, and this one happens a fair amount. Uh, um, but again, it doesn't matter because then it can just react again. All right, um, uh, another one that can occur is that we can have two of these carbon radicals come together. So CH3 three carbon radical plus carbon radical CH3, three. I just wrote it backwards. All right, so we'll have one of these there. And this comes to the same location. So that means we're forming a new bond between these two carbons. All right, and, uh, and there you can get that. All right, and then our final, uh, our final possible reaction is where we have the carbon radical react with the, with the halogen radical. As I mentioned previously, this one doesn't happen a lot, but it's really impossible to tell exactly how much it happens because it, the molecules that we make this way are indistinguishable from the molecules that are in the product. But... Uh, We'll have one of those radicals go there and there. So we're forming a new bond between carbon and bromine. All right. And as I mentioned, we're going to recall, we're going to call that 4A, 4B, and 4C. All right, so that is uh, part B of this problem, uh, and we still have a little bit to go. So now we want to calculate the delta H for each propagation step. 
each propagation step. We are going to use the same numbers that we have up here and recall that the sum of the propagation steps has to come out to this negative 67 kilojoules. So, um, so we can, you know, check our math, uh, make sure that we did everything correctly. So part C, and we're going to look at, uh, we're going to look at Delta H for reaction two. All right, and that's going to be the bond association enthalpy of uh, CH3, 3, carbon, hydrogen. So that's the bond that we broke. And then the bond that we form is the HBr. So we want to subtract that number, not add. bond association enthalpy of an HBr bond. All right, so this one, we'll come back up here, is worth 381 kilojoules. And then our HBr is worth 368. All right, and you can tell that's going to be a um, that's going to be a positive number. So let me clear this. So three eighty one minus three sixty eight, and we get oh, I put the wrong number in three eighty one minus three sixty eight, and we get positive thirteen. So positive thirteen kilojoules per mole. That means that that first step of the propagation or second step overall is uh, that for, that step is endothermic. Turns out that's important. We're going to talk about that here in a few minutes. Actually, in the next video, we'll talk about that. All right. So now let's look at delta H for step three. So in step three, we're breaking the bromine-bromine bond. So we'll have the bond association enthalpy of a bromine-bromine bond. And we'll subtract the new bond that we made, which is the carbon-bromine bond. So the dissociation enthalpy, CH3, 3, carbon, Br. And again, we have those numbers up here. The bromine-bromine bond is worth 192. And the carbon bromine bond is worth 272. And I'll show you where I got those numbers here. So 192 and 272. And of course, we got those off of the table that's in the appendix. All right, 192 minus 272. And that gives us negative 80. All right, now I want to point out something that uh, I said was going to happen and that is not very surprising is that the sum of these two comes out to negative 67 kilojoules per mole. And that's exactly what the delta H for our overall reaction was, was negative 67 kilojoules per mole. All right. So we've done delta H for each propagation step. Now we can do an energy diagram for each of the for for the two propagation steps. So our energy diagram will look like this, and this will be our reaction coordinate. So that's our reaction coordinate, and then. Uh, this is our enthalpy, and I'll just put H for enthalpy. All right, so put like that. All right, so our first reaction was endothermic by 13 kilojoules. So we'll start. All right, so that one's endothermic. And then our second step is exothermic. 
Now these aren't perfectly to scale, but it doesn't really matter. We have the numbers up here. All right, so this is our reactant. And so this is, uh, yeah, this is our reactant. And then this is our uh, intermediate in between two and three. And then this is our product. So uh, for transition state two, again is propagation step one transition state two and then this is transition state three right there all right and let's label a few things on here we will label the uh we'll label the the delta h2 so that difference there is delta H2 and then here I'm going to pick a different color to do delta H3 so that's delta H3 and then overall I'll pick an even another different color here And that is going to give us the delta H for our reaction overall. Sorry, it's all kind of crowded there. I'm going to zoom in. Let's make sure you can see that clearly. So, all right. So now our last thing. Last thing here that we want to do is draw the structure of the transition state for each propagation step. All right, so this this is important and uh, and it's it's a little bit different than the propagation or the um, the transition states that we've seen before. So um, let's look at our propagation step two here, which is the first propagation step. We've got CH3, 3, carbon, and we're breaking that bond between carbon and hydrogen, and we're making a new bond in between hydrogen and bromine. Now, there's one thing that we want to add here, and that one thing is, if we look at that propagation step, we'll see that in the reaction, the, uh, there's a radical on the bromine, but in the product, in the reactant side, there's a radical on the bromine, but in the product, there isn't. And same thing with the, our opposite with the carbon. In the carbon, there's no radical on the reactant side, but there is on the product side. Well, just like what we did when we did partial charges, we can do partial radicals. So we can put a partial radical on the carbon and a partial radical on the bromine. And this is our transition state for step two, which is the first step of the propagation. We're gonna do the same thing for this one. So here it's gonna be carbon, bromine, bromine. All right. And, uh, and just like with that previous one, we have a partial radical on the carbon and a partial radical on the bromine. And we'll call that transition state three. All right, well, that was a, a lot of material. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, uh, I will stop this video and we'll do the next section uh, we'll do the next section on uh, the second part of the video.